Well, thank you everybody for, for joining. Um, I'm very happy that so many of you are, are here. So, um, but first of all, thank you to Genevieve, Julia, Hill for the invitation and for organizing all of this. Um, it's a bit of an experiment to do an online talk for me. So if anything goes wrong, don't worry, just interrupt me. I won't be offended. And um, yeah, so hello to everybody. I saw on the list there are many dear colleagues that I already know. So hi to all of you. And to those of you who I uh, do not yet know, uh, thank you for being here and I hope we can meet uh, in person um, sometime soon. And I hope you're all healthy and, uh, and well. Um, so um, today I'm going to give a presentation on uh, uh, partnering behavior and uh, economic inequality. And uh, this will be a, a compilation of different uh, articles that I have been writing or I've written on, uh, on the article. And the focus, they are all comparative papers, but I will be highlighting always um, uh, where possible the UK uh, and compare them uh, to, to other countries. So, um, as I said, this talk is about uh, partnering behavior and more specifically about um, what, um, uh, what we call homogamy within relationships. So how similar are uh, partners to each other in terms of uh, all kinds of characteristics we might imagine. In this case, homogamy in terms of uh, socioeconomic characteristics. So how similar are partners in terms of their socioeconomic characteristics? And what is the impact of this homogamy, or sometimes uh, economists prefer to call it assortative mating, on uh, inequality between households? So um, let me first highlight that uh, the different parts of this presentation come from various works that I've been doing with uh, various co-authors, Milan Boucher-Vala, Iñaki Permanier, Sander Wagner, and Mette Gertz. Um, so, yes, let me start with uh, showing the, the basic intuition behind this idea. So, if we imagine, um, one question, Genevieve, can you see my cursor, the red one? Yes? Okay, yeah, yeah, okay, I saw it. Okay, good. Um, so, uh, imagine we have uh, four persons in a society and the size of each of these bars represents their personal income. If we, uh, so we have two rich persons and two uh, poor persons, so to say, or persons with less resources. So the basic intuition is very simple, which is if we put the two rich persons together in a household, if they partner, and if these two uh, persons also partner, we get a very rich household and a poor household. On the other hand, if we would switch it around and the rich person would marry uh, a poor person, um, and also person three and four here, they would form a couple or a household together, we would get a much more equal distribution of economic resources between households. Of course, there is always a question of inequality within households, so how are resources shared within households, but we're not going to, I'm not going to um, go into that topic uh, today. So kind of the question is how uh, do these patterns of uh, how similar partners are in terms of their socioeconomic characteristics impact inequality between households? And as you can see, this is a very simple idea and it's, it's uh, very powerful and it's therefore because if we compare these two situations, we see a situation of huge inequality and here by just changing the partnering, all inequality is eradicated. So in principle, uh, partnering behavior should, could have a huge impact on inequality. So the main question that I hope to uh, answer today is how big uh, is this impact exactly and have changes in how similar persons um, are within relationships impacted changes in inequality over time. So the general belief, uh, I think, is that this has had quite a considerable impact on inequality between households. This is, for instance, uh, an article from the, the Upshot in the New York Times talking about 
how uh, power couples reinforce income inequality. And there are many articles that can be found about this, arguing that this increasing similarity uh, between partners is a major driver between uh, a major driver of um, inequality between households. So uh, now I wanted to do a quiz, but maybe it's a little bit hard. So uh, just maybe wonder for yourself whether before today uh, you thought that partnering behavior or changes in partnering behavior, let's say in the UK, have been uh, a major driver of, of inequality between households, yes or no. Uh, I cannot really tell, but based on uh, uh, articles or Twitter, it seems the belief is that it did. So I hope by the end of the day, I will, um, I will have been able to um, show you whether this is the case or not. Uh, wait, oops, there's something happening here on the screen. Uh, Okay, sorry. Okay, so um, we can think about homogamy, like uh, academic articles that have looked at this issue. They have looked at various characteristics based on which uh, people can select each other or are similar to each other within relationships. The first one is education. The second one is basically just income or earnings. And the third one that there's much less about, but still interesting, is uh, social background. So uh, basically the socioeconomic position of uh, your parents. So I have written a little bit now, I've worked on each of the three, and I hope to cover a little bit of each of them uh, today. Um, so let's start with educational homology. How similar are partners in terms of their education? Um, here I will be discussing uh, briefly the results from this article which came out uh, recently where I compare uh, 21 countries and we ask the question, changes in educational sort of mating or homogamy, I use them as synonyms, uh, contribute to income inequality between households. So this um, article is actually based on the work of a British sociologist and a Spanish colleague, uh, Richard Breen and Lira Salazar, that have uh, done some things. Uh, so a lot of inspiration comes from the techniques and the methods that they have been using uh, 10 years ago already. And there's one uh, article specifically on the UK, but we expand this analysis in, in various directions, as I will explain uh, later. So uh, there are a lot of articles actually out there that have tried to estimate the impact of educational homogamy on inequality between households. And all of these uh, types of analysis, they basically rely on simulations. How high would inequality between households be under various possible simulated uh, scenarios? So normally what these articles do is that they divide the whole population into different groups based on in this case, their education. So this is an example from uh, close to home for me, for Spain. And uh, we see that this is basically a table, a cross tab of his education and her education. So what we see in this table is the distribution of households in Spain um, across combinations of the head of household and her or his partner. So there are 19.2% of the Spanish population in 2013 consisted of a head of household uh, with lower education and a partner with lower education too. So what a lot of these studies do is to shuffle kind of these distributions around and say, what if there would be much more homogamy? So what if everybody would be on this diagonal where everybody, where partners have the same level of education, or what if there would be much less homogamy and they would recalculate levels of inequality. So this is basically the intuition between, behind the methods that have been used in, uh, in these kind of articles. So keep that in mind that these are all uh, simulations which have a lot of other uh, problems and uh, limitations, but they can give us a nice idea of uh, how big impacts could be of changes in homogamy. So um, here we see a lot of formulas and you don't exactly have to understand uh, what is written here, 
but uh, this is the tile index of, of um, inequality. So the only thing that we see uh, that, that we should uh, take away from this slide is that if we have the tile index, we can calculate it by this formula. And we see that actually this formula is made up only of three ingredients. Pay J, which is the share of population in each group, which is basically what we saw on this slide. So we have the share of households that fall into each of these categories of the table. And we have the average household income of these groups, which is, for instance, what we see here in Spain, the average household income. And we have inequality within this group. So within each type of household, how unequal is income within these groups? So if we know these three quantities, we can basically do simulations by only changing this term of the equation. So we can keep these two quantities, we can keep them constant and we can start playing around with this uh, PJ and like that simulate counterfactual levels of uh, household income inequality uh, simulating various patterns of this page a. So this is uh, the method that was used already in these articles but green, by Green and Salazar. And this is what we have uh, based our analysis on too and which we, we extended um, further. So um, give an example, this is the example from Spain. Uh, for Spain, in this article, we had data from 2013 and data from 1990. And if we here we have the two distributions, the two the the pages of this equation here for the two periods of time for the two years. So we see that there have been a lot of changes between um, across these years. And uh, these are the levels, the, the observed levels of inequality in these two years. So inequality has gone up between 1990 and 2013 quite a bit in Spain. And this is the distribution of households across categories based on um, the partner's education. So I ignore here single people, which I can uh, say something about uh, later uh, if you want. Um, but what we do in these simulations is basically to apply the distribution of the past to today. And then we plug these PJs into this equation and recalculate levels of inequality between households. But of course we cannot, so the idea would be basically to say that we plug this distribution for 1990 into the 2013 numbers. But if we do this, there are two things changing. One thing is, of course, the pattern of partnering, but another thing is also that we change the total levels of education. And this is why I used Spain, because here there are dramatic changes in education across this time. So if we simulate uh, if we use this type of simulation, we are simulating both a great educational expansion, like there are many more higher educated people in 2013 as compared to 1990, and a specific pattern of partnering. And this is of course problematic because uh, we would like to separate the influence of ex educational expansion from the influence of uh, changes in partnering behavior. So uh, Green and Salazar, they kind of developed a complicated um, iterative uh, procedure that somehow uh, maintains the marginal distributions, but changes the specific partnering patterns. So this is quite complicated to explain how they exactly did it, but it's basically um, an iterative process where in the end uh, you hold this constant, but the relative uh, cell sizes, they are being changed to how this used to be in 1990. So this is basically the intuition behind this simulation is we 
control, we keep constant the marginal distribution. So these are still as in 2013, but we apply assortative mating patterns or homogamy patterns as observed in 1990. And then we calculate um, inequality plugging this PJs that we just calculated or simulated into this equation. So what we can already see here for Spain is that we have here a simulated tile index and we see that in Spain um, actually homogamy in the past was higher than it is today. We see the green numbers, they are the ones that increased uh, over time. So if we would simulate the 1990 distribution, we would actually simulate more homogamy in the case of Spain. As we can see, the numbers on the diagonal, the dia diagonal representing categories where couples have the same level of education, these percentages, we simulated them to go up. So we are simulating homogamy to have gone up over time. And that's why if we would simulate um, homogamy uh, to be as in the past in Spain, we expect or we estimate that inequality would have increased even more. So this is the simulated level of inequality that we see here. So to interpret this for Spain, and I will move on to the results to the other, of the other countries, is in 2013, in a, the tile of inequ uh, inequality between households in terms of income was 0 0.222. But if homogamy were to be as 1990, inequality would have been even slightly higher. And this is because actually in Spain, homogamy uh, decreased over time. So we've been doing this exercise for um, um, all the European countries that are available in the Luxembourg Income Studies. So the Luxembourg Income Studies is uh, a database that has, be, has often been used in many studies on income inequality and have harmonized uh, data on income, in our case, we're using equivalent disposable household income and education. So we selected all European countries uh, plus the United States and the yearly ends, they range from 800 in Hungary, which is really the smallest, to uh, 110,000 in Norway. Most of them have uh, a couple of or uh, several thousands of observations uh, per year. And here are some more um, uh, methodological decisions that have been made. So uh, the first step was of course to kind of check whether educational homogamy has actually changed over time. Here we see an overview for nine countries and we see uh, two trends here. We see the inequality trend which is basically the grain line with dots and we see that this has been going up in most of the countries. Inequality between households has been going up with some exceptions not a real trend here in Greece. And homogamy, this line is a very simple, simplified measure of homogamy, which is basically uh, the rank correlation of partners' level of education. And we see actually that rank correlations have been decreasing over time in most of the countries, with some exceptions like France, where it seems to have gone up over time. So what this would suggest is that actually educational homogamy has been going down. Partners. Uh, education plays a decreasingly important role in, in partnering, which is interesting. So this has actually also recently been confirmed in an article by the Howe and colleagues uh, uh, with using more complicated log linear methods that actually it seems that educational homogamy, how similar partners are in terms of education, is uh, going down. So here uh, we have the results for the UK. Unfortunately, in this paper, uh, the time span is a little bit short, but I will say a little bit more later um, about that. So here we actually do not catch the great increase in inequality in the UK, which happened here, but we only see basically this slightly downward trend in recent decades. And we see also that there's no real trend in terms of homogamy, but I will say a little bit more uh, about what we can tell about this period here uh, in a bit. So um, 
we basically uh, did the simulation, what we did before, applying patterns of homogamy from the past to the latest year for which we have data in each country. So if we have here a list of countries, we see the first year with data in the UK, 99, and the latest year with data, which is 2013. So what we do here is this is the observed level of inequality in the last year, and we simulate how high inequality would be if assortative mating based on education would be as in the first year. In the case of the UK, 99. And we see in the UK that it basically doesn't have any impact at all. And this is actually the median of across countries is very small. And if you see there are only a couple of countries like the Netherlands, Greece and France, where we see a little bit of a bigger influence. I can talk more about that later, but uh, the general conclusion is really that changes in educational homogamy over time uh, practically did not um, have a huge impact on, um, on inequality between households. Now you can of course say, especially for the UK, okay, you're looking here at a very short period of time. These are just uh, 14 years. So uh, maybe by missing the big changes of the 70s and the 80s, you're missing a, a big part of the story. Um, Therefore, we performed some more simulations. So here, first of all, we see the result that I uh, showed before, and uh, we decided to extend this analysis and do some more simulations. So we started to play around a little bit more uh, with alternative distributions of households across this table. So instead of simulating patterns from the past, we decided to simulate very extreme changes in homogamy. So this would kind of answer the question of, okay, we see that changes in homogamy have mattered very little, but another question that is interesting to ask is, do they have the potential to impact inequality between households? So would really extreme changes in educational homogamy, would they have an impact? Actually, the question for the UK is no. So we did some um, simulations where we would match people at random based on their education and estimated levels of inequality would change very little. In another simulation, we maximized homogamy. So we maximized basically the diagonal. We put as many persons as possible in the cases here in the diagonal. So in the case of High, high couples where both have higher education, we would put here 38.4. Um, we would always maximize uh, the number of homogamous couples and then fill out the table. This is also something that Green and Kalasar have done for uh, US. So if we do this for the UK and we actually maximize homogamy, or we say that partners' educations are not related at all, or we even simulate that there would be inverse homogamy so that um, so that partners would negatively sec select each other based on education. So higher educated people would actually partner as much as possible with lower educated people. Even in this extreme scenario, um, inequality would only go down with, I think, is seven, eight percent. Here are the results for all the countries. Here we see that this result is fr moving from the minimum to the maximum. It's 7% in the UK. And the UK is actually the country where educate the potential of educational homogamy to, in to impact inequality is the lowest of all countries. So there are some countries where the impact is greater. And you might ask, why is the impact so great in, for instance, France and Greece? And this is mainly because here uh, female labor force participation is much lower, uh, especially in Greece. And uh, education is very positively related with female labor force participation. So this is why when we start switching around, uh, um, simulating changes in educational monogamy, there's much more impact there. But remember that this would require, even uh, in Greece, this would require a complete switch from 
uh, inverse homogamy to maximum homogamy to get such a big impact. So to resume, do what is the potential impact or have, have changes in educational homogamy contributed to inequality between households? No, the overwhelming conclusion, and this also comes out of uh, earlier and then later articles, is changes in educational homogamy did not have uh, a huge impact on economic inequality between households. There is a potential for very extreme changes in educational homogamy to, income, to impact income inequality in some countries, but uh, such changes are so extreme that we're unlikely uh, to see them occur in uh, real life. So why is this the case? Well, basically most of inequality actually happens within educational groups. Of course, there are big differences in terms of um, average levels of income according to couples levels of education. But by far, I think it's around 70% of all uh, variation in income happens within educational groups. So this limits a lot the potential impact that educational homogamy selecting partners based on education is quite limited. So the implication of this finding would be that if we think, we might think, well, to really attack inequality between households, we have to uh, lower the boundaries that exist across educational categories. Um, but at least for income inequality, this might be important for a lot, a lot of other things uh, that we care about. But for income inequality between households is probably not going to do uh, that much. And we have to look at the sources of why within educational groups there are so many uh, differences in terms of income. Of course, you might wonder, well, okay, for the UK, you're, you have been using these three ISCAT categories. Uh, we simulated it also using more detailed educational categories. I think in the case of the UK, it was no qualification at all, GCSE, A-levels, bachelor degree and master degree. And basically, I think total potential impact only rose from um, 7 to 8 percent. So that didn't make a big difference. One thing that we haven't been able to look at and which would be interesting is, of course, uh, private schools and elite universities. But that would really require uh, a country specific study. Okay, so this is uh, educational homogamy. I will then go to the second part, the third part on social background. We're not going to have time for that, uh, I see already now. So um, this is ongoing work with uh, Milan Boucher-Vala. So um, in this um, article, we ask what I think is, is a more interesting question now uh, in hindsight, which is have, uh, has similarity in how much partners earn impacted inequality between households because here we do see clear these are earnings correlations from a study by Neuenhuis and colleagues from 2016 where we see that there's a clear upward trend in how similar partners are in terms of their earnings we also see in the UK that actually there was almost no correlation because uh, high earning men had um, uh, the partners of high earning men were mostly not working um, but we see that almost in all countries, these correlations have been increasing over time. So partners are increasingly similar in terms of their earnings. What has the potential impact been on economic inequality between households of these trends? Actually, the answer to that question is really complicated. Even if we look at existing studies, they come to uh, apparently contradictory conclusions. So here we see two examples of studies on the United States. There's the one by Swartz that says uh, that increases in earnings inequality would have been 25 to 30 percent lower than observed in the absence of changes in the earnings association. And RISCO actually using the same and colleagues using the same data say that only two out of the 69 percent rise in income inequality can be attributed to the combined effects of matching and coordinated labor supply. So even if we look at um, studies from on the same countries using the same data, they come to very different uh, conclusions, which is of course very confusing. So what is the answer? 
Um, first of all, I want to like, take a, a short break just to show a major source of uh, confusion and unnecessary confusion has actually been uh, this study by uh, most economists will think that assortative mating had a huge impact because of this study. Mary or like by Greenwood and colleagues and they actually reported that the Gini coefficient would have fallen from the observed 0 0.43 to 0 0.34 if uh, matching had been random. They also have estimates of changes over time. So basically in this study they reported a huge impact of changes in earning similarity on income inequality. It's cited a lot. This screenshot is a bit old now. It's already 300 something citations. But actually, this was all based on a coding error. So they actually had to correct the results. And this you can find this um, online, but it's a bit hard to find. So if you need it, just send me an email. And actually here we can see, for instance, this huge reduction that they document here from 0 0.43 to 0 0.34. And this uh, correction is 0 0.43 to 0 0.42. So this huge result that they found in this original article was actually based on a coding mistake and, and actually once done correctly, it completely disappears. Nonetheless, in these original quotes, I did not talk about these two studies. And there's still huge differences uh, between studies, even ones disregarding this most influential study. So why do different studies using the same data come to such different conclusions? Uh, I would like to illustrate this uh, with the most commonly used um, method in articles on this topic, which is actually a decomposition of the squared coefficient of variation. What we see here is an estimate of the coefficient of variation in household in income, which we can regard as a measure of income inequality between households. And what many studies have done is express it as follows. The coefficient of variation in household income is composed of inequality in women's income, the coefficient of variation in women's income multiplied by the share of women's income, the same for men's income, so inequality among men, inequality among women, and the earnings correlation between partners. So we see that there are different ingredients that together add up to this overall estimate of inequality in household income or variation, which is of course a little bit different. But there are many studies that have relied on this estimation or this simulation technique. And similar to the studies on educational homogamy, what they decided to do is, what if we keep this all constant and the only thing, the only term that we change is the row here, which is basically the correlation in partner earnings. So what many studies did was take the correlation from the past and plug it into the current estimate or the current equation calculating inequality for today. What is the problem with these um, simulations is that if we think about the processes that can cause increasing earnings correlation, there are three. First of all, um, partners can be, become more similar in terms of their earnings over time because there are changes in partner selection. So this is basically what we uh, saw in terms of education, educational homogamy. Since education is constant over time, mostly what we saw there are changes in partner selection and maybe changes in divorce, of course. Um, but in the case of earnings, of course, earnings change over time. So, that there, are, so there are a lot of other processes that start to matter here. So we have changes in partner selection that can drive up the earnings correlation. And we have changes in also who works. So basically processes that happen after the relationship has been formed. Uh, we can think here, for instance, that what has changed over time probably a lot is that the partners of higher educated men today are more likely to stay in the labor market uh, various for the partners of lower educated men, this might be hard if uh, childcare is 
very expensive. So these are two ingredients that can impact the earnings correlation between partners. And the final ingredient is general changes in employment. When employment rates go up, what happens is that we get a lot of more dual breadwinner couples and we get less uh, jobless households. So even with an equal increase of employment rates, we see that earnings correlations will go up. So there are three processes, processes that can impact the earnings correlation. So all these three processes impact uh, how similar partners are in terms of their earnings. A problem is that if we do the simulation where we only change uh, this earnings correlation, we ignore how these processes, these three processes might impact all the other parts of this equation. And this is especially problematic for general changes in employment because general changes in employment indeed make partners more similar because there are much more people working, so there are more dual breadwinner households and less jobless households. But the general changes in employment rates, they do not only change the earnings correlation, they also affect inequality within, among women and inequality among men. So what we have seen in most Western countries is that female employment rates have increased a lot over time, and this has increased indeed driven up the earnings correlation between partners, but it also hugely reduced inequality among women, especially. So many studies, if they only focus on this part of the earnings correlation, they only focus on one side of the story, and especially the side of the story that has a huge amplifying impact on inequality. Of course, if you only focus on this, you will find huge impacts of changes in the earnings correlation on inequality between households. But this is a very unrealistic scenario because we know that if the earnings correlation goes up, probably these other terms are also changing. And in the case of increasing female employment, we see that this contribution to inequality is going up, but this contribution to inequality is going down. So we have two processes that are cancelling each other out. And it's an empirical question, of course, how strong each of these forces are. So what we exactly did in this paper was to kind of estimate the influence of these different types of processes. So instead of simply simulating a different earnings correlation, we would kind of uh, simulate um, the influence of these processes and we can divide them into the inequality amplifying parts and the ones that are more hard to estimate uh, or the, their impact on inequality is harder to estimate in the case of general changes in employment. So here again we go back to dividing people into different categories based on how much money they make, whether they are employed and so forth and using log linear models we simulate different kinds of distributions of households across these groups. In the first model, we just reproduce the observed inequality trend. And in these log linear models, we first perfectly predict inequality trends. And then we start fixing certain parts of the model so that some uh, parts of this model become as in the first year observed. So these two, the red and the blue, they actually capture what are likely to be the more inequality amplifying processes and the green line uh, only simulates changes in employment. So more specifically, in this red simulation, we only fix the earnings correlation among dual breadwinner couples to the, what we have observed in the first year. The blue line, we simulate also unequal changes in employment rates. So who has become more or less likely to work depending on partner earnings? Have it been the partners of rich persons that have uh, started to work more or have it been partners of poor persons that have started to work more or less? So these are all very clearly inequality amplifying processes. But then in the final simulation, we also simulate changes in employment rates. So we kind of 
um, separates the inequality amplifying from the inequality uh, reducing processes. So I will give the examples of Spain and the UK and then I will finish. So in Spain we see that earnings similarity, this is the correlation between partners earnings among all couples and we see as in the UK it has been going up across time. These are employment rates, persons with non-zero earnings and we see that employment rates among women have skyrocketed over the time. Men has been going down a little bit after the crisis, of course. Um, we see that changes, this is the correlation between uh, the, the orange one, women's employment and men's earnings, and the other way around, and we see it has been slightly going up over time. And if we focus on dual breadwinner couples, we see that the correlation in earnings among dual breadwinners has been going down slightly. So we don't see huge uh, causes for concern here in terms of inequality. And actually when we simulate, we see this confirmed. So to repeat, the black line is the trend in inequality over time, has been slightly going down and in recent years has been going up a lot. And the red and blue line, we kind of simulate or estimate the impact of these disequalizing processes on inequality. And we see in Spain that they completely overlap with the black line. So they had no impact or a very small impact on inequality in Spain. And we actually see the only line that we can really see is that when we also simulate employment rates to have been as in the first year. But actually, if employment rates would have been like in the first year, inequality would be much higher than observed today. So these increases in employment rates have actually equalized earnings across households. And the other processes that we think about when we think about changes in assortative mating and how they might have impacted inequality, they don't matter at all in Spain. The UK is a little bit different. So there are actually a lot of countries, uh, most countries actually follow this pattern in Spain. And in most countries, assort changes in earnings similarity really did not uh, amplify inequality between households. The UK is a little bit different. Here we see the correlation uh, that I show, showed already before, that the earnings correlation has, like in Spain, been going up over time, in, uh, but a bit less than in Spain actually. And we see that female employment rates have been going up, but male employment rates has, have actually been gone down a little bit. Um, if we run the same simulation for the UK, we actually see the, for the first time these red and blue lines. And we actually see that inequality would be lower today if the earnings correlation among dual breadwinner couples would be as in the past and if uh, uh, changes in employment would not have been so unequal as has happened in the UK. So here, and actually if we simulate changes in employment, inequality would actually, if employment rates would, would be as in the past, inequality would actually be even lower uh, in the UK as compared to what is observed now. So, but also here, the, the estimated impact of changes in the earnings correlation is not dramatic. I think this is around 9% of observed levels of inequality. So to summarize, there are scenarios uh, I cannot go into much detail here, but uh, to summarize a, a bit more quickly, there are a lot of countries where any earnings changes in earnings similarity really did not have an impact on inequality between households. And this is, previous studies have suggested the opposite because they only uh, focused on one part of the story. They only focused on this part and they disregarded the impact that these processes had on inequality through the other parts of the equation. This also counts for the UK and other countries where we do see that earnings similarity mattered for inequality between households, but this impact is much smaller than what has been estimated in, earnings, in earlier studies. Still, the conclusion for the UK is the earnings association increased recently due to in unequal changes in who works because it's primarily the, um, the red line actually, no, okay, this is not right. 
uh, it is actually due to uh, changes in the earnings correlation among dual breadwinners. And this process actually um, uh, increased inequality over time in the UK. These are other countries that are similar to the UK in this respect, Sweden, Denmark, Norway, Canada. Countries that are similar to Spain are the Netherlands, France, um, Slovenia and uh, Austria. And there are a whole lot of other countries that kind of fall in between. So uh, increases in earnings correlations between partners are not necessarily worrisome. This is the take home message from here. This can be driven by increases in employment rates and increases in employment rates are very good news from an inequality perspective. But there are some countries where indeed there have been uh, some contributions of earning similarity uh, uh, between partners to, in to inequality. And I uh, in the UK, I think this is especially the case because not because uh, of changes in who works, but probably uh, changes in how many hours women are working. So my suspicion, but it would be great to find out about this in more detail, is that uh, partners of high earning men uh, now work full time, whereas they used to work uh, part time in the past. And this is, has been a, a process that has contributed to inequality. All right, I see that uh, we don't have much time left, so I'll wrap it up here. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to talk about uh, social background. I had the nicest graphs there, but uh, you can uh, um, uh, you can look them up uh, yourself. Okay, let me just uh, finish here so we have time for some questions. Uh, thank you very much. You have been very silent, uh, uh, so I've been able to do my presentation. Thanks. But now I would like to hear um, uh, what you think. Thanks. Okay. Thank you.